Hello, child. You've strayed too far from the path, and now trapped between the mirror and the thorns of the hedge. Welcome to Down the Rabbit Hole, a narrative horror podcast set in the world of Changeling, the Lost. Due to adult language and violent nature of the stories told, this podcast is rated M for Mature, and we strongly encourage listener discretion. Episode 5, Sanctum of Harvest. Walk alongside me, child, if you think you can keep up. Ever notice, by the way, how goodbyes are enthralling the same way that a good cry is? A solid goodbye washes over you like a splash of cold water on a hot day. I was considering stranger things that live here in the hedge, across the highways of fantasy. I was thinking about hubris, of all things. Have you ever watched a cat stalk a bird? The cat doesn't train for it, merely follows its instincts. It knows how to sneak, to lay low and still, then to pounce. No second guessing. That is the cat's relationship to the birds. What are birds, the things upon which I pounce? It would never occur to the cat that it could be hunted. That's what makes mortals so dangerous. They have a knack for survival that supersedes their usual narrow-mindedness. They will internalize trauma and use it as anger to fuel their efforts. They'll masquerade their prejudices as righteousness. They make martyrs of themselves to face and escape their fear of death. Clever and mutable as they are, though, the gentry are far more so. That's why you'll never hear of the freehold capturing a member of the gentry. Too much risk. It'd be like buying a bear trap from a hunter and expecting and hoping to capture him in it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but haven't we passed that stone before? The one with the yellow lichen in front of the hangman's willow? No, it's not my fault, child. I am the Vathek, and the Vathek never walks the same path twice. Hence why I can never be caught. Then you take the lead if you're so gung-ho about it. Oh, now this clearing I know we've passed before. There's the Winnebago camping trailer and the tent outside of it. Huh. Others have been here, it seems. Once upon a time. All right, this is ridiculous. I'm not passing the same fork for a third time. I believe we can reach the morning light if we double back. Listen to me. You don't understand how dangerous the number three is. Two is coincidence. Three is a pattern. That means it can change. That means it can be reverted. That means it forms a shape. It forms a shape. Three forms a form. Three, like the stages of a woman's physical life. Three, like the Holy Trinity, acts of a play. Three, like the punchline to every Jewish joke. No one leads the Vathek anywhere. Glass. I can't, I can't walk, walk past, past this line, line of trees. trees. Is, Is this, this your work, work child? child? Oh, I see. Yes, yes. we've walked, walked into, into her dream, dream haven't, haven't we? we? Trapped. trapped. You, you think, think you've trapped, trapped me? me? Oh, no. That's, That's not as clever as you think, child. child. Because, because you, you are here with, with me. me. No. no. My lantern. My lantern. Give, give, give it back. back. Give... give Give it back to me now, child. It won't work for you without me. It cannot be taken. It must be given. That's right. Run as fast as you like. You've set your own trap. You can't. I am the Vathic. I am the Vathic. I am...
Anytime one of them come through, it's treated like a terrorist attack within the neighborhood. Ever hit a hornet's nest like a piñata? Imagine if all the hornets had no stingers, knew they had no stingers, and you knew it too. Buzz, buzz, threat, threat, cry until your pants get wet. Fingers get pointed, rivalries turn into fights, motleys try to call meetings, bridge burners beat their chests, and everyone either screams or cries until they reset to their emotional numbness. I'm down for about a day before I get the phone call I'm expecting. It's Hatch Watch. Of course it is. He and I escaped Arcadia around the same time. Came out a few weeks between each other. I'm pretty sure we had the same keeper. The wizened within the Five Burrows Freehold. We keep closer than everybody else thinks. This loyalty goes beyond allegiance to the seasonal court or even a motley. The wizened, we all start as craftsmen when we're humans. And then we get taken, and we become drudges, test subjects, slaves, cogs, functions, nameless trash. That level of mutual degradation goes deep, keeps us together. I ask Hatchwatch to meet me near the loading dock of a storage facility. I'm still under oath that I'd keep this investigation quiet, even under Steel Spine Stan's nose. I imagine the Autumn King is having his hands full of panicking citizens and failed negotiations with the Summer Court. Anytime there's an attack, Summer Court always plays the Fox News we told you so nonsense and they demand to stay in power just a little longer. With the Solstice passing, I think Stan's gonna want his court showing up in full strength and a high-ranking member like Kip needs to start making public appearances pretty soon which is why I waited for Hatchwatch to call me. Let him come to me desperate. We meet someplace during the day, near temporary stairs and humming air conditioners and industrial fans that'll keep our conversation private. He makes me wait over an hour, which I spend kicking every yellowing leaf and stick off the concrete floor because, well, I have to. Hatchwatch is a tiny man with a large mustache, and his shoulders move too much when he walks, like a first-generation animation of a steam engine. I can see his glass eye twitching around, independently, scanning for any lingering glamour or contracts in use. Finding nothing, seeing that I haven't set any trap, he sits down in front of a tan-colored tops in the corner. They're draped over some burlap diapered saplings that are going to be transferred to another museum. He tells me the rumors that I already know. That a keeper got loose. Came here to New York. Wreaked havoc. Killed a bunch of mortals. I ask him what he knows about Lady Fung and her adjunct fetch building business. Both his eyes go wide. The real question is, I begin, since I have no sense of tact is why you'd hire me to find Kip when you were holding her fetch the whole time. Hatchwatch is so dusty and still he could be a Warhammer figurine. The accusation sends him stuttering on his P's and S's, saying that he needed someone to find a way inside the fetch's dreams, where Kip ran into, where she's still hiding. I tell him that's a really odd request, considering that he is the Freehold's most experienced dreamscaper. Ever see the movie Inception? That's Hatchwatch's day job for the Freehold. Retrieving secrets, planting doubt, making sure powerful donors sleep well at night, no matter what they did to get the money. I take a step closer, and Hatchwatch tries to run. So Pete grabs him from behind the tan sheet. Paranoid as a changeling may be, sometimes they forget about the good old methods of hiding. Pete has his hand covering Hatchwatch's mouth as I walk toward him slowly. I hold up Lady Fung's contract, and it states that several Bunyip Wallace fetches were commissioned by Kip herself, and they were delivered to the Autumn Court's facility, nicknamed the Sanctum of Harvest. It's a corporate facility just under the Brooklyn Bridge, and they were delivered no more than a week ago. One of them was beaten and left at Mount Sinai Hospital before it could be completed. 
which leaves one in the hands of the Autumn Court. Pete carries Hatchwatch to a plastic barrel filled with water. I ask him again, why bring me in? Because she's trapped. Pete's tall enough to hold Hatchwatch upside down and lower him into the barrel, backward. Soon as the bubbles lose their intensity, we lift him up for air. He says the fetch was meant as bait, except it's so heavily sedated with drugs and magics that it's never going to be able to wake up. And that's what Kip was hoping for. Kip stole something very precious to Stan before she dove into her own fetch's dream. Something powerful. It's an artifact called the Hunter's Horn. First time I've ever heard about it. Says according to legend that if you blow the horn, you summon a true fate to fight by your side. Problem is, then they take you on as a servant. Permanently. Nobody expected her to steal the damned horn during the suicide mission to try and capture a keeper. Figures. Autumn Court always trying to do the same stupid shit. Always trying to arm wrestle a shark, forgetting about the teeth. So Kip's trapped in a dream of a comatose construct with a fae. You telling me that was a whole plan? That's fucking stupid. Hatchwatch says they couldn't get inside the fetch's dream because it's Kip's fetch and Kip's blocking them from within. He says that even if they tried pulling her out, they'd have to fight the fae that she's with. Pete drops him to the ground, choking, sputtering, vomiting water. You want to know what I've gone through the last week? A lot. And I think I found the tools necessary to get to Kip. I think I can enter her dream. And if you truly want to save her, if that's why you called me into this, then you take me to the Sanctum of Harvest, or you lose her. He says he won't. That'll let Stan know that he went behind his back. And since Kip stole from Steel Spine Stan, he's fine letting her stay trapped. Figures, that walking Radio Shack sculpture of a king is ready to abandon his own. We put our trust in other changelings, because we know what we've all been through. Who else would stand up for us and our rights? Who better knows where to twist the knife? Then we're done. I have Pete drop Hatchwatch backward back into the barrel again. And we leave. If he stays calm and he rolls his shoulders in, he'll be able to back himself out slowly enough to escape. I feel slighted. I feel used. And I feel angry. I've put my fucking neck on the line. Almost been killed twice in one day. And now it's for nothing? Can I tell you something that you don't want to hear? Abuse is a cycle. Keeper takes you, drags your skin over the thorns until your soul gets caught, punishes you for obscure fairy laws without reason. Then you come back, empty and angry with no filter because anger is a rush and for abuse victims, it's the only fucking thing they have in their lives that is definitely theirs to feel and it's something they can control for themselves. Wizened, we get flushed out, discarded, we get thrown onto a pile. We're fucking refuse of the refugees. All the anger, and none of the strength to justify it like the ogres. None of the power of the elementals, not the beauty of the fairest. We get jack of shit. Just a wheel of barbed wire rolling down a hill. And every person who tries to get close to you is just another ten feet higher to roll down until you find someone smaller than you who you can abuse back. I got duped by someone I trusted. And I still don't know why. I could just let this be the end of it. Stan's gonna look like a fool if anyone learns about his court dealing with the gentry. Or building fetches. Or letting their own people get swallowed up. If I mention it, of course, I'm dead. I want to say fuck them all. But I made an oath to find Kip. Never occurred to me that she'd never want to be found in the first place. So, between you and me, what to do? Stock up on glamour. 
You see, summer is the season of wrath. Winter, it's despair. Spring, it's desire. Autumn, fear. But summer, wrath. When you harvest glamour with anger, summer's gonna reward you. In the afternoon, I roll my lawnmower onto the street just as someone turns off the highway. Giant metal clash. Driver tries to swerve, hits a lamppost, but still totals the lawnmower. Driver is a young lady. She storms out. I get close enough to hear her. Then I shove her. Then I turn to walk away. She grabs me by the back of the shirt and spins me around. Nothing but curses. Good. It's all I deserve. She slaps me, almost scratching my eye. I get the warm rush of glamour in my middle as her wrath feeds into me. A little bit later, I pull myself off the sidewalk. I spit up some blood. It's a good harvest. Good harvest by a bad person. The sun is long down when Pete and I make a move on the sanctum. Big gray building. I turn to Pete before we go in. And I say he doesn't have to do this. I made the pledge. He doesn't. He pets the mushroom rills under my neck with his rough finger, which always tickles. So let me ask you, since I know what you're thinking, how can two changelings get inside a locked building that they're not welcome in? Plenty of ways. Ogre would just lob a car through the window. A fairest, like Green Gracie, would simply walk through a mirror or ask anyone for their key. A beast, be it a swimmer skin or a hunter heart or a venom bite, they could just ask any insect inside to unlock the door or follow a scent trail through the hedge and inside of a broom closet back to the real world. A darkling, ooh, they would slide through the windows or ooze through a crack in the wall or locate someone afraid and become that fear thus manifesting inside the room, or maybe they would just walk through someone's shadow. Goblin contracts, anyone could get those. They could open the door easily, but then your home would invite strangers. He would even welcome them. No lock would keep them out. We could age a wall to beyond crumbling, or we could reduce it back to wet mortar, change its time slot. We could melt the glass or short-circuit the electricity from anywhere in the city block. And that's before we even open the can of worms of entering people's dreams. Me? I walk up to the front door, and I knock. The speaker squeaks, and I'm surprised to hear Stan's voice. Stan, the man himself. It's Woodrow Brindle, I say. I know about the fetch in your basement. I have the tools to enter its dreams and pull her out safely. About 30 seconds later, the door buzzes itself open. Inside the basement, Pete and I are noticeably more uncomfortable. We're in a makeshift operating room, with a young black woman resting in a hospital bed. Looks just like Kip's mask, but it ain't her. Lady's hooked up to a breather and a heart monitor. As long as you treat a fetch like a person, it'll sustain itself as a real person, mask and everything. If they killed it, chopped it up like the broomstick from Fantasia, Kip, and the artifact she stole, they just vanished like a nightmare in daylight. Stan's looking well, imposing and terrifying as a golem. He's dismissed everyone else, and even though the room is evenly lit, his personal weird is so powerful it shapes the shadows toward him, making his green eyes almost glow in the contrast. I tell him about my pledge that I made with Hatchwatch, that I can reach Kip and I can pull her out safely. If I can bring the hunter's horn back to him, I will. It's my promise. How often do we have the chance to do good and don't? I go to the woman in the hospital bed. On top of her bed sheets, I lay out the coin from the wishing well the mannequin from Lady Fung, and the clay heart with the timepiece in the middle. I'm about to start chanting when Stan crosses the room suddenly and shoves me aside. 
He says the two of us never had a deal. When Pete moves in to try and grab him from behind, Stan backhands him, and I hear a clang like a frying pan as Pete's head snaps back. Son of a bitch. Even now he wants to find Kip just so he can strangle her personally. I remember the wording of my oath, though. And I remember how I built in a contingency plan for this. I call Stan a liar. Cheater. No better than a privateer. I call him heartless. Garbage. King of the nerds. And as useful as a scarecrow stuffed with birdseed. The heavy click in the air tells me that the weird is listening and fact-checking my oath from last week. So I continue talking shit. How could I ever trust such a coward of a king who's more scared of a sleeping girl than anyone has ever been scared of him? Now you see, I promised to never speak poorly of the Autumn Court. If I ever did, Stan's footsteps ring like a hammer on an anvil and he lifts me up like a bag full of leaves without any effort. The scratches boiling up my throat, telling me that the weird is not happy that I just broke part of my oath. And when I open my mouth, a swarm of insects bursts out. I kick Stan and the steel toe boots I borrowed explode in the shrapnel. My feet are gonna be sore, but Stan's gonna take the worst of it. Bugs like grasshoppers with heartless black eyes and stingers instead of wings are swarming over the comatose lady in the bed. I grab Pete and I place his hand on the triad of objects on the bed. And with a push of glamour, we enter the Fetch's dream. When I come to, I check Pete's head. He's got a dent in the side of his skull where Stan cracked him good. I reach into his satchel and I pull out the longsword from Kip's trailer. Slowly, Pete comes true, and he checks me for scratches and injuries. I don't feel safe where we are. Cold, linoleum floor, spotless, even of dust. As far up as I can see are metal cages and walls made of animal carriers. They stretch so tall, my Greek landlord would get a boner if he saw him fall. If they're not piled on top of each other, they're being held together by some kind of black ivy, ending in thick black roses. The walls lean gently to and fro in a breeze I can't feel. The plastic and metal are straining from the weight on the bottom. Okay, the hand got us in. It thought it was part of the fetch. That means we got recognized. Hopefully the heart will lead us to Kip herself. Pete stands up slowly, and he looks all around us. No plants, no ground under us. He starts moaning in concern. We walk the narrow pathway that's no more than three feet between the endless wall of cages, and we reach a fork. Part of the path goes to the right, part of it goes to the left. Figures, this fetch thinks it's Bunyip Wallace, the most paranoid escape artist in our freehold. Of course her mind would be a maze of cages. Worst part is, the longer we walk, the more shifting and scraping I hear. It'd be too much to ask for the cages to be empty. Pete is edging arrows into the floor, using the sword, trying to get a sense of direction. Something rattles the cage near his feet, and he steps back before a paw swipes out at him. I hold up the heart, and I try whispering into it. Kip! I say, it's me, Brindle, your friend. I'm asking you, please help me find you. Let me bring you home. Must have used the wrong word or two, because there's a rusty swing from way behind us. One of the cages opened itself. Then, up above us, another metal cage opens its door. Then suddenly two more. Then five. Something hops out of the distant cage and turns to face us. Tiny, furry, but intent. It's not a rabbit. Too many eyes and teeth. It's watching us with the hungry patience of a gargoyle. Suddenly, more tiny bodies are dropping from the cages. 
dozens at a time, blocking the way we came. Run. Run! I tell Pete, who drags the sword behind him as we bolt, dodging down the ever-narrowing paths as the smaller things start chasing after us. A cage topples from above and noisily crashes against my head. Pete picks me up under his arm and picks up the pace. He turns left, then right, then left again. All these turns are slowing us down, and I hear an approaching maelstrom of tiny claws gaining on our asses. Push the walls, Pete! I tell him, and he swings the iron sword wide and collapses the walls of cages behind us. More and more doors are swinging open, some of them in front of where we're heading, and we're running out of places to duck. I notice a small door to the side, red and black, with harlequin diamonds painted along the side. I yell at Pete to go through it. Even his shoulder doesn't make it budge. The tidal wave of furry bodies and falling metal boxes getting closer, and I try the mannequin hand on the doorknob, and it clenches and turns automatically. The door opens. Pete tosses me through. He rolls through and kicks the door closed, just as a living wall of bucked teeth and red eyes lunges at us. Grass beneath us. Stony soil. Sticker weeds. Everything you'd either not want to walk through, or wouldn't leave any footprints if you did. I think we're getting closer. A few wooden benches, topped with those black roses again. Behind us, a city project. The kind of housing you'd see everywhere in the Bronx. Giant concrete pipes line the outside of the building, though, like sewer pipes, and they all close around the front. They encompass the entire building like a rib cage. I'm thinking home is where the heart is. But is Kip leading us to her home where she grew up? Her home as a changeling? Her home in Arcadia? Against all my better judgment, I hold the coin and the clay heart, and Pete and I enter through the front doors. Kip, if you're in here for real, and you have any intention of coming with us comfortably, or quietly, or conscious, I hope you can hear me say this. You better be worth it. Crawling flat on broken glass to you, to you. Down the Rabbit Hole is part of the Chroniclers of Darkness. It is written by Uncle Yo. Original music and production by Jimmy Lin. Special thanks to Eliza Rickman for permission to use her music. Find her and become entranced by her at ElizaRickman.com. Thanks to White Wolf Publishing and Onyx Path Publishing for this elegant game of beautiful madness. Comments? Questions? Hollows for rent? Say your name three times into a dark bathroom mirror. Trust us, the gentry are listening. This podcast is produced thanks to Patreons like you. Join us at patreon.com slash Uncle Yo, or contact us at facebook.com slash Uncle Yo. Thanks for any shares, retweets, likes, and tokens. Game on. Include everyone. And remember that death is more merciful than the keepers. Catch you next week. Hear the greater call come to break and fall on you, on you, on you. Make a twisted face, walk a light away.